Aksab, but I, are we live? In one minute. Good. Uh, looks like we're live now. Yes, we're live. Aapki jadat se, Aapa, Sid Saab. Bismillah. 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 Salaam, Adab, and welcome to what promises to be an epic conversation between doctors Adra Raza and Siddhartha Mukherjee on Dr. Adra Raza's groundbreaking book, The First Cell and the Human Costs of Pursuing Cancer to the Last. Organized by Habib University, I am Wasif Rizvi, president of Habib University. Few months ago, we had the privilege of hosting one of the world's leading intellectuals, Professor Noam Chomsky. I at that time thought that it would be at least a year or so before we will have such luck in attracting someone of similar stature and impact. As it turned out, I was exactly 200% wrong. It has only taken us three months to have not one, but two remarkable thinkers, practitioners, artists, scientists, all combined. We are privileged to be in the company of these Azim Athan, two great ones. The formal introduction of one of these two greats of the author Azra Raza will be made by our distinguished discussant, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee, or Sid, as he is fondly called by many. I, however, must confess to some ambivalent feelings in making this introduction. You see, prior to Googling Sid's name, as a child of South Asian parents, I was reasonably content with my life compared to your regular Shabir Sahib or Sharma Sahib's children. I had made my parents proud and happy. But I got to tell you, for the first time, I'm somewhat relieved that my parents are no longer alive to see what Mukherjee Saab's boy has accomplished. Stanford, check. Harvard, check. Oxford, check. Authoring Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times bestsellers, check. Paradigm changing research and insight about the world's most devastating disease, check. Oh my God, dude, you got to chill. You are making it impossible for any average Ivy League schmo they see to follow you. What's more remarkable that everything that I just listed are diluted understatements about the impact and genius of Siddhartha Mukherjee. His voice is not of merely a world leading expert about cancer. His scientific brilliance coupled with his literary virtuosity make him a cultural phenomenon and an icon. Great argument for liberal arts education, by the way. Siddhartha Mukherjee is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at Columbia University in New York where his groundbreaking studies into the composition and behavior of cancer cells have pushed the boundaries of modern medicine. Dr. Mukherjee's innovation, innovative research signals a paradigm shift in cancer pathology and has enabled the development of treatments that reach beyond current pharmaceutical models towards new biological and cellular therapies. Dr. Mukherjee generates hope for countless patients and families around the world while revolutionizing our blueprint for healing. Siddhartha Mukherjee is the author of The Emperor of All Maladies, a biography of cancer, which earned him the 2011 Pulitzer Prize and The Gene, an Intimate History, which won international awards and was recognized by the Washington Post and the New York Times as one of the most influential books of 2016. Sid, along with Adra Apa, are our fearless and noble warriors, taking on this mighty emperor of all maladies. What's especially poignant is to see that these two great South Asians from UP, Islamabad, Delhi, regardless of the ravages of the last eight decades, share this urgent common purpose and born in this fight. And in the best traditions of us, with such grace and such beauty. It's my great honor to now invite our discussant for today, Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee. 
Dr. Sai. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really lovely, lovely introduction. Um, it's now my privilege to introduce Azra and her book um, and talk a little bit about her book. Um, this is a very large task because um, Azra is a little bit like a kaleidoscope. Um, if you turn her left, you see a new vision. If you turn her right, you see a new vision. It, you know, and you don't know whether it's mirrors or whether it's the pieces of glass, but every time you turn uh, the kaleidoscope, it becomes a new vision. Um, which brings me to optics, because um, of course it was 19th and 18th and 17th century optics, which not only invented the kaleidoscope, but also invented the microscope and the telescope. And there is something in Azra which has both a microscopic and a telescopic quality. I want to talk about those two things. The microscopic quality is to go into her own life, to go into the life of a patient, to understand the minutia, why this cell is ruffled while its adjacent cell is not, why this bone marrow looks this way and why these blood counts are that way. The telescopic quality is to take huge step backs from the microscope and ask questions about where we're going, why we're going there, what happens and what happens in the future. So uh, um, Azra is three scopes combined in one, a kaleidoscope, a microscope, and a telescope. Um, we have a technical issue with Sid's feed. Appa, you may want to um, okay, get in I touch can... with Sid. All right, I'll get in touch with him and uh, or we can uh, simply continue. I can take over. Yeah, while, while we wait for him to get back online. Ah. Okay, Sid, so you're back, but you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm on a very powerful connection, so I don't know what that, uh, what, well, why that is, but anyway, it may be because of the long distance. So I want to talk a little bit about the book. Um, it is a memoir on one hand. It is also a, a memoir of her own husband's passing and her, her response to it. It is a history um, of her exploration into where we are in cancer research. But also it's a manifesto and, the, and the, it's a manifesto of the future or where we should be going as we move forward into a new future. So it's three books in one and yet it reads as if it's one whole book. And much like Azra, she is a multiple instruments but reads like one human being. Um, and Azra and I have worked together scientifically, medically, professionally, but also I would say artistically for more than a decade. Um, but let's begin with the book because then we'll start the journey somewhere. Um, so Azra, tell us what, what, what's the main message of the book and tell me about uh, sort of what prompted you to write it. Thank you, Wasif and Sid. The primary message of the book is not rocket science. Basically, in a nutshell, I'm advocating for the earliest, earliest possible detection and elimination of cancer. Now, I emphasize 
two well-known facts about cancer to do so. These are beyond dispute. The first is that 90% of cancers that are found at stage one are cured, but 90% of those found at stage four, we are still struggling with to find a solution for them. So in other words, the earlier we find cancer, the better. This is undisputable. Well, the question is how early? Why should we be satisfied with finding stage one or stage two? Because those still require brutal treatments. Which brings me to the second indisputable fact about cancer, which is that it starts in a single cell. So my challenge is why are we setting our goal so low that, okay, let's find stage one and then treat patient as if we are hitting a dog with a baseball bat to get rid of its fleas. No, we need a more compassionate and a more universally applicable solution. And that would be prevention by targeting the first cell. Also, Sid, as you said so beautifully just now, there's something so compelling about you whenever you speak. Uh, I've forgotten what I was supposed to say in the introduction, thanks to you. But actually, the second message of the book is within the subtitle, which is the human costs of pursuing cancer to the last. So not only is my call to find the first cell and target it and eliminate it, but also to stop obsessing so much about trying to cure cancer that we are forgetting the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the financial anguish that we are causing to the patient, to the families, to our society. I think what I am saying is we need a holistic approach. And by holistic, for God's sake, I don't mean we should be sitting under a bunion tree and eating pumpkin seed and chanting hymns. By holistic, I mean think about the whole patient, not just about the cancer. And the last thing I'd like to say about the book is that, in fact, the book has many authors. It's not just me. There are testimonials from patients who are alive now who have been negotiating their way through this tortuous journey of having a chronic disease requiring weekly blood or platelet transfusions for years. These are very serious tools on people, yet their nobility of endurance, their courage, which is what we take as helium for our spirits comes through. In addition, there are, for example, chapter six about Andrew is basically written by my daughter Shahrazad and Andrew's 25 year old sister, Kat. But I would say that my favorite part of the book would be the last section, which is written by families of individuals we have lost years after we lost the patients. I go back to families and I ask them to cast a backward glance. And now that they have the luxury of time to let things settle where everything is not immediately hyper-reactive, to, to tell us what decisions would they have changed? What choices would be altered by this period of now registering and processing all the information? And frankly, the impetus to write the book now, Sid, has been both scientific and a human angle to it because we are failing at both spectacularly. And this is what brings me to ask you because as you very well know, and I proclaim it from the rooftops that you are the single best science writer that history has seen. And that is pitting you against some real grapes. But I think The Emperor of All Maladies, your book, has really shifted the paradigm seriously. And it is, there is a very good reason for why it is included in the curriculum of the best universities already. 
So I'd like you, I'd like to ask you before we end the subject of my book to tell us how you use the story of the Persian queen Atossa in your book and what is that strategy and what uh, the point I have tried to make in the book you made with this just one story. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think that um, when I was writing The Emperor, like, you know, it, it ended up being a 600 page book. And when you write a 600 page book, you need at places to stop and evaluate where you've been, where you're now and where you're going. I mean, the book, The Emperor of Maladies was inspired by a patient asking me the question in the middle of her chemotherapy, where, where was I, where am I now, where am I going? What does my journey look like? And I'm very fond of this idea of journey because it implies a kind of process that you take. And, you know, there's a whole history of books, uh, great books that have to do with nothing to do with cancer, but have to do with journeys. But cancer is a journey, as you know very well from your own family. And so I took, in the middle of the book, I often took these kinds of things that I, I would do things that no one would would do otherwise. I might write a chapter, which was one paragraph long, because the weight of that paragraph, which may be a conversation with a patient, the weight of that paragraph is enough to sustain an entire chapter. You don't have to write more after you've had that conversation, and writing more actually diminishes the conversation. Um, on the other hand, I might take a kind of thought experiment, the idea uh, you know, borrowed from the from the physicists of the 19th century and say, let's perform a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is let's pull, let's pull someone from history and migrate her through time. And in this case, it was in, uh, with breast cancer. And, and, and here I asked the question, what would she look like today? What would she feel like today? And what would she feel like 10 years from now or 20 years from? What could we do to her? And of course, at the end, we come to the idea that, you know, the, the early detection of her cancer and appropriate therapy for that early detection of her cancer would be her future. That is very clearly what you demarcated in your book is the future of, of where we're going. I like in particular, Azra, this idea that you said in, in, with patience of looking back and, and understanding the future, right? Looking back and understanding what decisions could they have made, what decisions could be made, etc. Now that idea, of course, comes not only from medicine, but of course it comes from the humanities. It's a, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in medicine, it comes in many forms. It comes in the form of the word of autopsy, right? But that word is a very beautiful word. Many people might not know that autopsy, that word comes from, to see for oneself, autopsy, right? To learn or to see for oneself. And when you as a doctor go back to a patient and or go back to a patient's family, you're also performing a kind of autopsy, a psychiatric autopsy, a medical autopsy, because you're seeing for yourself what would have happened or what could have happened. And I think in some ways, your book is also, aside from, as I said, many books, it's also an autopsy. Um, and that autopsy has to do with going back in time and finding the first cell. Um, so tell us a little bit about what the first cell is and why it's important and why it, it is the title of your book. Well, I think um, exactly what I said, cancer begins in a single cell. But our problem is that it's a silent killer. So by the time you have even a 0 0.1 millimeter of tumor, it has 300,000 cells already. And a one centimeter tumor would have billion cells. So how are we going to then find a first cell in uh, when the presentation of the disease um, occurs when there are billions of cells around? So 
which takes us back another step then, that instead of waiting for a disease to declare itself, the future belongs to monitoring wellness to find illness. And not just cancer, Sid, it has to apply to everything in medicine. We have to pivot from being a reactive science to being a proactive science. And we need to go and find the first cell as soon as even before its appearance, because there may be footprints, biomarkers, signals of stress to an organ, even before a cancer arises. And with time, we should be able to develop the technology to monitor that early stage. That's how early I'm talking about, because cancer doesn't, just doesn't happen, in my opinion, due to random mutations because of aging. No, it happens because there is some kind of a stress that is telling cells you either fight or flight. And in fact, there's a third response in addition to fight and flight, which is freeze. Sometimes they just freeze in place and wait it out till the stress goes away. But if, if a cell is frozen and waiting and keeps synthesizing its DNA and the stress doesn't go away, it's likely to make more mistakes. And that's how cancer can arise. That's how the first cell can arise. So that's a very radical hypothesis, Asra. And talk a little bit about it because in your lab, in your work, you've been finding, you've been looking for this, these first cells and to do that, you have this incredible resource, which is your repository of tissues. You've been collecting tissues long before anyone had the wisdom to collect tissues from patients with cancer. I want you to talk a little bit about the, the real value of that tissue repository and how that value of, of, of having patient samples from decades now informs or can inform a newly radical idea of treating and thinking about cancer. It reminds me of a very beautiful share, by the way, Sid, because no one can blame me for being inconsistent. I've been very consistent right from the beginning of my career. <clears throat> As you pointed out, the tissue collection I have began for a reason because I came to this uh, to the United States as a 24 year old fresh graduate, an immigrant, a Muslim, a woman arrived here to cure cancer because that's how 24 year olds feel. So I started by treating and studying acute myeloid leukemia. Within eight years, it was very apparent to me that in my lifetime, this malevolent, malicious, horrible disease will not be cured. And I wasn't wrong because as you know, in 1977, I was treating acute leukemia with two drugs popularly called seven and three, seven days of one, three days of another. In 2021, I'm still using the same. So I turned my attention in 1984 to listen to my patients who were giving stories that Dr. Azar blood counts were low for years before we developed this leukemia, sometimes for months. So that stage is called pre-leukemia and it occurred to me that the disease surely must be less complicated. Now, you, you know, said I divide people, generally I know between people who knew me when I was with Harvey and people who met me after my whole life was over with Harvey. And had you met Harvey, you would have enjoyed this comment because when I told him that I'm going to now study myelodysplastic syndromes because they are the pre-leukemia, his response was, no one can even pronounce that disease. You're <laughs> never going to get a grant. So now you know how much I listened to that man because from that moment on, that's all I did. And I started saving samples because it was very natural to me to think, oh, being an immigrant, I didn't even think of making some kind of a model in the lab. I said, if I'm going to study my patients, I should save their samples. And this is how in 1984, the tissue repository began. I was going to talk about for a second while you go on, how radical this idea was in 1984. Like no, <laughs> one, was, like no one was taking tissues and spending their own money and putting it into a repository. And now all of a sudden, you know, people talk about, oh, tissue banks, et cetera, et cetera. 
But in 1984, we never we hadn't heard of this idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was. I think it 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 was because I'm an immigrant, and I trusted by instinct rather than tradition or custom. Said I honestly feel that. Had I gone to do a, to school in this country, I would have done exactly what others were doing because it seemed like a very natural thing. We weren't. We didn't know then how uh, some of the things could be misleading. So uh, it was radical, but I didn't feel it was radical at the time. I wish I can give myself credit that here I was an original thinker, but only in retrospect can you assign that to me. And I also feel, by the way, that the real, uh, real uh, uh, precious nature of this repository will be appreciated only after I'm dead and gone, because people are not even I hope not. accept yep. the, People are still not willing to accept. And you know very well because you and I do fundraisers together to support this tissue repository, which costs a million dollars a year just to maintain it and to add fresh samples to it. Costs us a million dollars a year. And yet there is no funding available for it. So it's still a radical idea. Still, the, we don't have the support. My idea about finding the first cell is that we have patients with acute leukemia, but then I have all their marrows going back to the, their samples going back to that first stage when they were diagnosed with pre-leukemia. So then you can ask me, well, what have I been doing for the last three decades? Why haven't I found the first cell? It's because it turned out that one technology wasn't there when we had the technology. It turns out that Pre-leukemia itself is a cancer and it kills patients. So by the time we diagnose pre-leukemia, it's also already too late. So then who are the people who are at high risk of cancer that we can study? And that's a question that um, is now being answered by, uh, by the oncology think tank, which I put together this last summer. As soon as we went on Zoom, I had the idea that, uh, you know, building a consensus is very important. Why should I be the only one proclaiming this from the rooftops that we need to study the first cell and prevent? Why aren't people who are studying pancreatic cancer doing the same or ovarian cancer doing the same? We should all be doing it. So I, uh, uh, you were the first one. We discussed it. I got together 30 top leaders from MD Anderson and Harvard and University of Chicago, Hopkins, major institutions in the country to come together, make the think tank. And we agreed that we have to find cancer at the first cell level. So how should we do it? Well, who are the people at risk of cancer? They are individuals who have survived one cancer. And I don't want anyone in the audience listening to this to start getting anxious because we either have cancer ourselves or know someone who has it and or who has been cured of it. And I don't want you to think, oh, Dr. Raza is saying that you are now at high risk of getting another cancer. No, the idea, yes, there is a higher risk. And Harvey, my husband, is the best example because at 34, he got one deadly cancer, survives that tormented journey. And then at 57, got another completely unrelated cancer and dies from it. So if we can find the first cell in people who are at high risk, we can prevent that from developing into an end stage monstrosity. So the idea is have a cancer survivor center, which means just save 10 cc's, 20 cc's of their blood, their saliva, and just periodically look for the first cell. That's it. And, and, and tell us a little bit about, you've already started looking for these first cells, right? And um, tell us about how that's going and some, some new leads and, and, and how excited these people were to sort of rethink the cancer paradigm when you brought together the think tank yeah. over the summer. How excited, you know, people who've been in the field for 40 years, 50 years, thinking, gosh, you know, if we only had a, a, a consortium to discuss these ideas. Um, tell us about that excitement in the field. Well, I think everyone recognized Sid, that the only decrease in cancer mortality has come so far from either anti-smoking campaigns and lifestyle changes or early detection of cancer through the conventional means like mammograms and PSA. So I'm proposing that there, a natural evolution of these screening measures is to use more sophisticated technology. 
Now, no one can argue with the fact that we need to detect earlier and earlier if possible. And two, we need to develop the technology for it. And by the time the first cell is formed and it starts shedding its markers in the blood, it is, they are so rare. Let's say it's shedding its contents in the form of uh, DNA or RNA or bits of protein, right? They get diluted with the billions of cells that are also shedding, which are normal into the blood. So even the kind of uh, detection technology that is being developed based on biomarkers, measurements of mutated DNA, even that can only detect 30% of stage one cancer, forget about the first cell. So my idea has always been that you can't develop technologies that can't even detect the stage one or two when you're talking about the first cell. So basically then we should trap the first cell. That's my idea. How do you trap the first cell? Um, our colleague, uh, Patrizia Petrolini in France and so many other people now have developed uh, uh, various ways of uh, catching uh, larger cells. And cancer cells are larger than blood cells because blood cells are the smallest. So if we simply take liquid biopsies, which means 10, 20 cc's of blood, pass it through a filter, Blood cells will go through, first cells will be, uh, the large, uh, larger cancer cells will be found. And then as you know, I'm very excited because our, this work has now shown that in fact, the first cells are not just large, they're giant, giant cells. And giant cells are always formed in response to some kind of stress. So now our whole idea, my, what I have been saying for years that there's some kind of stress to which cells are responding. And now we see that it's a natural response which goes awry. Um, what is your sense of how this might be applied to, you know, the changing of the paradigm towards more detection and more uh, and earlier detection? Of course, creations for countries like Pakistan and India, where, if, where, you know, treating cancer at its end stage has not just the toxicity of the drugs, but financial toxicities, which are unbearable. Um, what is your sense how, how, how this paradigm shift would affect uh, developing countries? I think that's a question close to our hearts and you and I talk about this all the time. So one of my favorite books, by the way, as you know, is Moby Dick. And what I learned from it is that once the electric bulb comes along, we don't have to go whaling to get the blubber of whales to make oil for our lamps. Nobody thinks about whaling anymore. Once you have something dramatically different, like once you have the word processor, who's worried about the typewriter anymore? My insistence is what Thomas Kuhn said, if you want to shift the paradigm, show the success of the new one. And I think we can show the success. And Sid, I want to ask you something. You see, the only way to find the first cell is look for it in humans, all right? Which means we need human tissue. Now, you know that um, the most important study that was done to do whole genome sequencing, which means study the entire genome of cancers, was a collaboration between 750 cancer centers in four <laughs> continents. And they published six papers in Nature on February 5th of last year. And they studied two 2000, I believe it was uh, 2,600 samples from 38 different cancers. They performed whole genome sequencing. So this project in four continents was worth over a billion dollars. Six papers in Nature, I'll summarize for you in two lines. You know what was their conclusion? Of course, you know, but for the audience, number one, cancer is very complicated that there are many clones, many cancers within one cancer. Yes, we knew that all along. Sequencing proved that. 
And the second thing that it proved very interestingly, the second conclusion they had was that the next phase of cancer research has to be clinical and on the bedside. And you know why they said that, Sid? Because there was 0, 0.00 clinical data available on these samples. So that you couldn't relate this person lived 10 years, this patient died within one year, this person who lived 10 years, his uh, sequence in the DNA revealed these generic mutations. They just didn't have that information to relate it to, the, to what they were finding. And my question was, why was a project of this magnitude even undertaken without having clinical information? Why are we making the availability of clinical samples and clinical information so difficult that our PhD real scientists have to resort to animal models because we are not providing them with the samples. And why should it be the purview of even only oncologists to control these samples? And anytime somebody tells me, oh, it is so complicated, privacy issues, HIPAA issues, I see this is a country that has thousands of nuclear weapons. And it you've, be... you've surmounted the privacy and HIPAA issues yeah. in your... Exactly. I, as an individual, have been able to save 60,000 samples. Not one breach has ever occurred. But how many people want to do it? I want to start a national drive for making humans, because there's no dearth of patients, for God's sake. There's no dearth of cancer specimens. Why are we not, st we not studying them, even in a study like that? So, okay, I'm going to stop here because I get too worked up about this whole thing. I think... Uh, I have endless sympathies with my basic scientists, and um, um, I think our, uh, in a way, we need to get off the high horse. We were arrogant to think we'll be able to solve this problem without having to study actual human tissue. But I think everyone is realizing that now. Don't you agree? I absolutely agree. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I said before, your book is... I want to come back to the book. Um, it is. It would be a um, misapprehension to think of this book as a science book, because it, because like you, um, it is also a kaleidoscope, and it moves between stories of some of the patients that you described, uh, your own family, your daughter's best friend. Um, and, and many of your patients. Um, and when you move from the realm of science, which is very much in the book, to the realm of describing the lives of these patients, um, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of poetic change that happens. Um, the important thing perhaps to recognize is that that poetic change is 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 dyadic in and it, it's it remains um, it remains part of the fabric of the book. So it's not as if all of a sudden you know you're reading the first cell and say, oh gosh, now here's Azra moving from her her science uh, piece to her patient piece. These are woven in and they become part of the part of the whole story. And, and the story is a story. It becomes part of the story. Tell us how you did that or how you, how you achieved that. And also tell us why it's important. And then I want you to bring, bring you back to a book that I, the first book of yours that I read, which was uh, about Ghalib. Um, and how that book um, influences and, and, and turns this book into this kind of poetic metier. Um, um, so it's a complicated question. Take it as you will. But, but, uh, but, but tell us about how this book yeah. sort of put together and how that, that book on Ghalib uh, really affects this book, which no one might even, not even you know, you might, might not even know. People are reading this book around, around, the, around the world. They don't know you as someone who's translated, um, you know, thousands of poems, um, they know you as an oncologist, they know you as a, an oncological thinker. So tell us how these things are, are part of the same 
kaleidoscope. I'll answer this question if you promise that when I ask you next, to tell us about how music affects you so profoundly. You're going to do it, okay? Okay. So look, um, experiences need an expression. They don't need statistics. In fact, they need poetry. Why? Because poetry, physics, mathematics, basically the literature, they're all doing the same thing. They're putting our experiences, our observations, either into symbols or into couplets or into a double strand of DNA, two lines of a share equal to, equals two strands of the DNA, a macrocosm within a microcosm. Also, because reading poetry, you realize that somebody else is saying in a better way what you wanted to say, what was in your heart. غالب دیکھنا تقریر کی لذت کے جو اس نے کہا میں نے یہ جانا کہ گویا یہ بھی میرے دل میں ہے that's the beauty of poetry that it seems to to be able to open doors between people between cultures between all of humanity i mean i can't begin to tell you how many times said i use poetry to relax my patients and uh, how they respond so beautifully to it. Emily Dickinson, I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me and life was not so ample, I could finish enmity. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I had no time to hate because the grave would hinder me and life was not so ample, I could finish enmity, nor had I time to love. But since some industry must be, this little toil of love, I thought, was large enough for me. It's an expression of the toils of love, really. And uh, I feel that there is a couplet for every bit of anxiety I have, every bit of insecurity I feel. And just to, to finish, my expression of poetry before I ask you, which you promised to do, um, I want to, uh, to pay my respects to you and to Wasif Rizvi, the president of Habib University, and to thank him for inviting me uh, and Sid for this beautiful program. So Sid, you may not know it, but, but in Sindhi, Sindh, of course, uh, Karachi is in Sindh, that's where I grew up. And Sindh is in every fiber of my body, what can I say? And one of the most gorgeous, beautiful words in Sindhi... By the way, I, I, I understand about 80% of Sindhi. No way. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to test you right after we yeah. hang up. <laughs> <laughs> so you know then, because this word I'm going to use is very much like the word in Urdu, kafir. Because kafir can mean, you know, the pagan, but it also means the beloved. So, and it is a word that is used with the greatest of affections. Kafir. The same way in Sindhi, we have a word, sighing. And I will end by reading this brief poem. I'm sorry, I apologize to those people who can't understand Urdu, but this is just a one minute tribute to both. Uh, to but Maybe, maybe and you me. should translate, maybe you should translate afterwards. Uh, maybe after we hang up, people want to hear the translation. You know how much I hate doing that. Sid. I know you're abusing me and you're pulling my leg. So this, uh, this poem is written by a lovely uh, a, a, a physician who is now a very famous hepatologist in Sacramento, California. But 30 years ago, he worked in my lab. And he was a young man who Dr. Yasin Atir, Muhammad Yasin Atir is his takhallus. Tum se agar na milta sain, kaise wakt guzarta sain? तुमसे अगर ना मिलता साईं कैसे वक्त 
گزرتا سائیں میں ہوں ایک مسافر گویا تم ہو میرا رستہ سائیں تم سے اب کیا راز چھپائیں تم سے اب کیا راز چھپائیں میرا راز تمہارا سائیں ساگر سے گر پیار نہ ہوتا دریا الٹا بہتا سائیں ہم اور تم ایک ساتھ اکیلے کمرہ ضبط سے مہکا سائیں واسف when you and i are talking as you know and said when you and i are talking as you know everything else becomes silent meri baatein kaan tumhare wasif aap sun rahe hain meri baatein kaan tumhare beech mein ek sannata saaye sannata sunsho aur kaagaz par do char lakeere aur na kuch bhi likha saaye میں نے پہروں سوچا سائیں کوئی تم سے اچھا سائیں تم کو کیا بتلائیں سائیں کوئی نہ تم سے اچھا سائیں تھینک یو اینڈ سیڈ آئی ہوپ آئی وانٹ ٹو ٹیل پیپل سم تھنگ اباؤٹ سیڈ دی ادر ڈے وی ور ٹرائنگ ٹو گیٹ ہولڈ آف سم بگ وگ ان آن کالوجی and sid wrote to them they didn't respond i texted sid what's happening so sid texted back khoob parda hai ki chilman mein chhupe baithe hain khoob parda hai ki chilman se lage baithe hain saaf chhupte bhi nahi samne aate bhi nahi so sid as he mentioned at the pre-Zoom meeting that he has spent the last year, really uh, uh, this lockdown, social isolation, to familiarize himself with the great Ustads. And at the moment, he is obsessed with Daag Dehildi. So we exchange a lot of uh, poetry of Daag and we exchange a number of uh, wonderful anecdotes about him because there was no more colorful poet than him. Uh, but I would like to ask Sid before we end and go on to question answers, because the most gorgeous times I have really is when Sid and I are pulling all-nighters um, in Mehfils, at, either at my home or Sid's home, uh, and he is uh, rendering the most moving, profound poetry in his gorgeous voice. People don't, may not know this, But of course, they know that Sid is a man of 30 dimensions. He's a great chef. He's a great artist. He's a great teacher. He's a great scientist. He's good at everything. And one of the things, but the thing he was being raised to do was to sing. He was supposed to be a vocalist and he rebelled and became a scientist. So his mother actually thanks me for bringing back that part of his uh, personality after not singing for 20 years he returned so i'm going to ask him to you know the pakistani uh, pakistanis love poetry like and indians of course the people of subcontinent love poetry like no other people on earth and no one will appreciate this more than what you are going to do for so i only did this because azra said uh, whenever azra asked me to do something i usually do it um but uh i i generally never perform in in conversation so you have to excuse me about that but uh you know why not do something new and try something new um I thought I would sing two, three lines and then maybe I, I want to talk about the poem because I'm very kind of moved by, by the poem. And so sometimes I might go into extempore. Um, you know, the great photographer Danita Singh said that, you know, what's missing in music to some extent um, and missing in poetry to some extent too, poetry readings, music renditionings, is the informality. Um, informality creates a kind of space which allows a kind of, uh, which allows a discussion where you feel free from 
being judged. And this is how Azra created her tissue repository. This is how she created, you know, wrote a book on Ghalib. This is how she has, you know, created a practice. And this is what ultimately leads to the idea of the first cell, the TOTT, the, the Thought Leaders Committee, et cetera, et cetera. And that is to preserve a kind of informality. Um, and as soon as you make things formal, as soon as you make things, as soon as you tighten them, there's a grant due, there's this that has to be done. That spirit that human beings have of the, the capacity to exchange ideas for themselves, for no other reason, and with no shame, shameless ideas goes away. And that's a terrible tragedy. And that's why when you ask people, you know, what was the best time in your life? They say the college, they say college. And that's because that was the time when they could say the most foolish things or the most wise things. And they were intermingled together. Um, so anyway, so uh, that's just a prelude um, of, of, I'm going to sing two, three lines, but I want to talk a little bit about um, this incredible piece of poetry. Um, I turned on some, it's too loud, so I'm going to turn it down. And this poetry is familiar to every one of you, but I've been looking at it and over and over again and thinking about it. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Mudat hui hai Mudat hui hai Yaar ko I'll read one more phrase. Yes, yes, by all means. Dil, ah, <laughs> Dil hai, phir wohi, Bismillah. 
दिल ढूंढता है फिर वही फुर्सत के रात दिन दिल ढूंढता है फिर वही फुर्सत के रात दिन ए बैठे रहे बैठे रहे But this is the most beautiful word, Azrat. The sabure jana. Bethe rahe. The sabure jana. Kye huye. Almudat hui hai. प्यार को मेहमान मेहमान की किए हुए जो शे खदा से बज मचरा किए हुए यार को मेहमान किए हुए जो शे कदा से बगान किए हुए That's my contribution from today. Um, but I wanted to talk about one thing before we end up. Because I spent, you know, these months in lockdown, etc. Um, thinking about this lovely word or this lovely phrase. Muddat hui hai, which is simple. Long time has passed. And now comes the beautiful word, Yaar ko mehma kiye hue. You can take that phrase and write a full book on it, Ezra. What does it mean to make your lover a guest? A guest of what? And who's the lover? Is it God? Is it science? Is it the first cell? Long time has passed since I've made my lover a guest. A guest of what? A guest of my thoughts? A guest of my impulses? A guest of my, the deepest things that I feel? I, lit I have spent probably, I would say, months. Muddat. Muddatin. Thinking about how to even convey that line, to translate that line to anyone. And to bring the conversation full circle, right? Cancer is an un unwelcome guest. It's an unwelcome guest in anyone. But the radical idea that is in the first cell is to say, 
it's a part of ourselves. The cancer cell is a part of the, a distorted version of a human cell. And rather than wait for it to invade and take over our bodies, what if we turn the paradigm around, like Azrast says, and think of it as a guest? And I will quote the last lines from Marilyn, um, from the great poet, um, who says, uh, my father, um, and she's talking about her father. Um, my father was honest when he welcomed guests and said, treat my house as your inn, inn as in I-N-N. -N. And the last line is, inns are not residences. So um, with those words, I'd like to finish uh, this uh, incredible session. And uh, Wasif, uh, you know, there's some questions here, but maybe you can, you can take, take us away and, and close us down. And if there are any questions, uh, please uh, go ahead, Azra. Right. Well, it, it seems uh, a little gustachy to, uh, to continue it with some, you know, to follow what we just heard from uh, you know, the rendition of Sai and then uh, this sublime Ghazal, which uh, is perhaps uh, Mirza Ghalib's, one of his most famous kalams, right? Uh, but uh, we have to respect our audience and, and, and uh, there are, uh, a couple of questions here, Azraba. Um, so there is, there is one from uh, Judith uh, Rabbits. Um, how can you eliminate the first giant cell after it is detected? What's the elimination of it? Let's say we follow the first cell instead of the last. <clears throat> Sid, are you still there or are you rushing to catch your train? Uh, because I'm still here. I'm still so, here. Sid, I think you should answer this question because uh, Judith uh, and Ikhlaq, we really missed you just now uh, because Ikhlaq, uh, Ustad Ikhlaq uh, Hussain is uh, uh, the maestro who is a sitar uh, great right now. And uh, they have moved to Geneva last year and we missed them in New York because uh, um, he was always... Uh, uh, the star performer with Sid. Um, Judith, that's a beautiful question you're asking. What do we do if we find the first cell? I'd rather Sid answer it because he's developing that technology. Sid, talk about your cellular technology. And by the way, uh, Sid said that he has spent this uh, lockdown <laughs> reading Urdu along with uh, writing six articles for the New Yorker, opening four companies and uh, perform and and and. Uh, also, uh, writing another book, but what else, Sid? Well, you know, um, one of the things that um, I think COVID um, uh, created a kind of manic carpe diem in my brain, <laughs> um, which only lockdowns can. So one of the things that we've been doing is we've been training normal cells T cells, immune cells, myeloid cells. I've actually we've been able to train all of them to find such giant cells. Um, what's amazing about these cells is that unlike drugs, they are living. So we call them living drugs. Um, we train them, and they behave a little bit like uh, you know the sniffing dogs at the airport. The normal drugs that we use in the body have a problem like aspirin or other drugs, right? So they act on their, uh, what they're supposed to act on, but they have no capacity for surveillance. You don't think of a drug as a mechanism of surveillance. Um, living drugs, because they are alive, um, have a capacity for surveillance. They, they keep looking and they look again 
and they keep living and looking and looking again. And we have trained uh, T cells, myeloid cells, and other parts of the immune system to keep looking and looking again for these cells, for these first cells. And on, so it's a, it's a really, it's a yin yang project. On one hand, Azra's group is defining these giant cells and figuring out what is special about them. And our group is figuring out if you can tell me what's special about them, I can train your immune system and pack it so that you can create a surveillance system, which is not a, not a drug, but a living drug that will exist in your body for a long time and go from, your, you know, from luggage to luggage, just like the dog sniffers at the airport and essentially detect the cell. And that's what we're doing. Another quick question uh, from Chris Taylor, who is our uh, vice president for academic affairs. Uh, what if the first cell in quotes isn't a cell, but an organelle? Hi, Chris. That's a good question. Well, we should be able to catch it, whatever it is. An organelle means that within a cell, there is something else besides the DNA. Uh, an RNA and protein that we've been looking at. What if it's uh, uh, the Golgi apparatus or is it the mitochondria that has gone awry? Well, that's what we are trying to do, uh, Chris, is to catch the first cell. And these can be caught on filters, but also our colleague has now developed the technology that they can be collected in a suspension, even though they are one in 50 billion cells that are circulating, one in 50 billion. Just because of size, we can enrich their population by catching them in tubes. And then we are now studying the giant cell by multi-omics technology. One single cell by proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, everything you can to study, to find the unique markers. And if it's not the whole giant cell, it's something inside the giant cell, that's what we are trying to find exactly. And then we turn it over to Sid and say, okay, the, this is what's unique about this cell compared to the other cells in the body. Now you train your uh, immune cells to come and target specifically, and this will individualize cancer treatment like no other precision medicine has done. Wow. So I think um, we'll stop the question and answer in respect for uh, Sid's re request. Um, in the beginning that he has a pressing commitment. Before he leaves, I just want to quote Ghalib for him. I mean, this was the first time I, I, I saw him and met him. Uh, I'll meet via uh, virtual technology. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> it's like a digital lock, Sid. As soon as you find the right combination, it separates. So That's perfection means also spell separation. What a beautiful shape. Go ahead, Wasif. Sorry to inter interrupt, but I'm a ghalib aficionado oh, and interpreter. You can, so. you can actually spend your entire life in this digital this digital or numbered lock has this, this agonizing irony that it only stays together when you don't know the right combination. And tha likha baat ke bante hi, jaise hi baat ban jati hai, it separates. How beautiful. Yes. Well, with those lines, thank you very much. And um, I'm delighted to be part of this August Forum, and I hope um, we meet again in person in the in another world which is not so darkened by medicine. Thank you, Sid. I I would like to just uh, formally conclude with with um, with these words. Uh, somewhere in the 14th century, uh, a Syrian muwaqqid. Um, Abul Hassan ibn Ibrahim, also known as Ibn Shatat. Mawqit is timekeeper in a mosque. <clears throat> Centuries before Copernicus or Galileo put to rest a 1,000-year-old, utterly wrong, geocentric model of 
Ptolemaic astronomy. This model was quasi-sacred for Greeks and Romans, but Ibn Shatir was not too concerned about preserving this false dogma. Azra Apa has created a comparable revolution in the approach towards treating cancer. It's obviously jarring to a deeply entrenched cut, burn, poison enterprise of cancer therapeutics. Unlike Ibn Shatir, who had to wait two centuries before the world began to come around to conceding to his findings, we don't have to wait that long. One obvious service is for us to support the widespread reading of this seminal book, The First Cell, and the human cost of pursuing cancer to the, law, to the last. The publisher's basic books in the US and Lightstone here in Karachi in Pakistan have made it extremely easy for all of us to buy multiple copies for a list of people whom we want this book to be mailed to, and it gets delivered. We have done that from uh, the platform of Habib University, and I urge all the participants and whoever is going to watch this program to consider something along these lines. Azarapa, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for liberating us from circling the last cell and start thinking about a different kind of universe vis-a-vis -vis cancer. Adab.